Grade 12s, we are going to start with organic chemistry. And this question, question number two, involves naming of organic compounds and all other information related to that. All right? Notice now, and use your booklet as well as we go through this. Question two states, the letters A to D, and there we see them in the block indicated here. There's A, there's B, there's C, and there's D. These are all organic compounds, right? They represent four organic compounds that belong to different homologous series, right? I think you know what that statement really means. So our first question is, define the term functional group. Grade 12s, this is a very important definition. Make a note of this. A functional group is defined as, as the examination guidelines state, a bond, you can also say, or an atom, or you can say a group of atoms that determines the physical and chemical properties of a group of organic compounds. Have you got that great twice? So a functional group is a bond or a group of atoms that determines the physical and chemical properties of organic compounds. All right? Keep that in mind. Now, 2.2. Write down the letter that represents a hydrocarbon. Remember the definition of hydrocarbon is those are compounds that have carbon and hydrogen only. Those two compounds. They don't have oxygen. They don't have a halogen. Only carbon and hydrogen. Now looking at A, B, C, and D. What do you think, Ray Twelves? Which one is a hydrocarbon? Let's have a comment from you. Is it A? Is it B? Is it C? Or is it D? What do you say? Mr. De Villiers, when we have someone there, if you can let us know. Maybe they're even typing in the chat. I'm keeping an eye out on the chat for you, sir. I will shout out the answer as soon as I see one. All right. Okay, a hydrocarbon. Which one is it? A, B, C, or D? Do we have any response there? Not yet. Okay, great. So, great 12s, it cannot be A. All right. The reason why it cannot be A, while you find a whole lot of carbons and a whole lot of hydrogens, there's a bromine there. So, that's a halogen. That is not a hydrocarbon. Right. So, A has disqualified itself. What about B? Ah, uh, look at the end here. It's an L. That means this is an aldehyde. This is not a hydrocarbon. So it's not B as well. What about C? Oh, look at this. There's an oxygen. This does not have carbon and hydrogen only. So C also disqualifies itself. Hence, it's not A. It's not B. It's not C. The only correct answer is option D. Have we got that great twelves? Do you notice how by a process of elimination, you can cut the answer? All right, so the answer for 2.2.1 is D, is the only hydrocarbon in this box here. Then 2.2.2 says, write down the name of the functional group of compound C, right? What do we call the functional group of this? What do you say? Any comment from you, Great Twelves? Feel free, don't be shy. Remember, we, we're here to learn and to sharpen our skills. Is there a comment there, Mrs. De Villiers? Not yet, not, not yet, yet, Mr. Goldson. I'm assuming maybe by quarter past eight this morning, everyone okay. is going to be warmed up. <laughs> okay, <laughs> all right. So grade 12s, this group, is called the hydroxyl group. Please do not write hydroxide, all right? That's wrong. It's hydroxyl. Remember, at the end, there must be X, Y, L. So that's the hydroxyl group. That's the functional group. 
please keep that in mind. Okay, great. So, so far, that is a hydrocarbon, the only one. This is the hydroxyl group. What about 2.2.3? I mentioned it just now. Shame, I gave the game away. The homologous series to which compound B belongs. You may remember from your lessons, grade 12s, your teacher obviously told you that all organic compounds that end with AL, butanol, they are aldehydes. That is the homologous series. Okay, so the correct answer for 2.2.3, it's, it's the aldehydes. All right. Now we're going to 2.3, naming of the compounds. This is where things really get very, very interesting. The question says, write down the IUPAC or UPAC, as some people say, right? The UPAC name of the compound A. Now, we have to be very, very careful here. You remember grade 12s, when we name an organic compound, you must go for the longest straight chain, right? Now, you may look at this compound and say, okay, the longest straight chain is one, two, three, four. These are carbons. It doesn't stop there. You see, it goes like this, straight this way, and then it goes down, and then it goes this way as well. So look at this. The longest straight chain starts from here. One, two, three, four, five, six. Can you see that? There are six of them right there. Okay, right. Now, here we are. What I'm going to do, I'm going to switch on my visualizer. So. What we've got here, grade uh, 12s, right? If you look at compound A, we've got a hydrogen here. Then we've got carbon, 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 right? Another hydrogen here. So this is a very important question, you know, naming of organic compounds because it carries lots of marks. And you know, grade 12s, the truth of the matter is even if for some reason you make a mistake in the naming, along the way, you can score quite a few marks. So don't give up and don't give in. Don't say, oh, I don't know what's going on. And therefore, you know, you lose a whole lot of marks. And so the story goes, right? So don't do that. Okay, great. Now, grade 12s, here we are. We've got this compound, right? That's what we saw in our question. Take note, one, two, three, four carbons, five, six. I mean, remember the straight chain and that way. But you may say, but now, why are you counting from this side? Could it not also come from this side? Well, here is the detail. You must realize one thing, that the halogens, and I'm going to highlight bromine. Bromine is a halogen. That's one of the attachments. This must get the lowest number in the chain. All right? So we can't go one, two, three, four, five. No, no, no. We have to go one, two, right? So in other words, I'm going to number my carbons and say that's carbon one, carbon two, carbon three, carbon four, carbon five, carbon six, right? Do you notice that bromine is attached to the second carbon? Now that's going to be important for us in terms of the name. But also now, very interestingly, while that is the longest chain, I've got further attachments on the chain. Look at carbon three. I've got this methyl group here, and I've got another methyl group here. So now that is important. There we have that, okay? Notice, there's my straight chain. I'll draw this in red here. As you can see, it goes this way, then it comes down, and then that way, all right? And now attached to my third carbon, I've got these two methyl groups. And then attached to my second carbon, I've got the bromine. Right, so how do I name the compound? Very, very easy. I start with this. The name of this compound, grade 12s, is none other than 2-bromo. And I stop there for now. Remember, between the number and the words or the letters in the word, there must be a dash, right? So the compound starts with two dash bromo. This indicates that there's a bromine, a halogen, attached to the second carbon, right? Then I'm going to put a dash, and on the third carbon, I'm going to say 
three comma three. That means on the third carbon, as well as on the third carbon, right? They must be dimethyl, but because that's, I must put a dash there, dimethyl, right? So the di means two of them, methyl, there's the methyl group. And then there's six carbons, so that is hexane. Okay, there's the name of that compound. Let's go through this again. 2-bromo. That indicates that on the second carbon, there's a bromine attached. Remember, bromine is a halogen. They found in group 17 on the periodic table. Then dash 3, 3, 3, dimethyl. There's two of them. That's why it's dial, di. You can't just say methyl. And then hexane because there's one, two, three, four, five, six hex and it's an ane. There's no oxygen, no other compound, nitrogen or anything else. This is the name of the compound. All right, so we got that grade 12. That is the name of that organic compound. All right, now let's go back to our question. The next one, compound D, right? Let's keep this page and get another page there. Compound D, we look at compound D, right? Compound D, as we can see on the screen, we've got here C, H, 3, C, and there's a triple bond, right? C, H, right? That's what we have here, right? C, H, 3, there we go. Now, we go back here. There we have this, okay? What we have here, we know by virtue of the fact that we have a triple bond, the final part of our compound must end with ion. In other words, this is an alkyne. Remember, it's an alkyne. Right? That's the homologous series to which this belongs. So it's an ion. But the bond, if we look at the bond, it's the first bond. So in other words, here's our first one. Here's our second one. One can call it like that, right? And even the third one, one can say, right? Let's, let's just say three. But we are more concerned about what's happening here. So very important. There's going to be dash one, dash. And because there's one, two, three carbons, it's going to be prop, prop. Right. So there's the name of the compound. Prop dash one dash ion. All right. What will also be honored is to say propine. Right? That will be honored as well. But the more correct nomenclature in connection with this is prop dash one dash ion. Why prop? Because there are three. Remember, whenever you have three carbons, you're going to have P R O, prop there, and so on. Okay? And that triple bond represents the alkyne uh, homologous series. And that's why this is prop dash one, dash I. All right, so that's the answer for that one there. All right, we move back to our question now. Here we are, we have 2.4. I just need to move this a little bit. Okay, let me take this this side here, down here. All right, now, compound B has many different isomers. Oh, this is nice. Remember, grade 12, isomers are like the twins in chemistry right? The twins and so on. Remember, you have positional isomers, chain isomers, functional isomers, and so on. Now, first question says, define the term isomer. Well, as you know from the examination guidelines, isomers are organic compounds that have the same molecular formula, but different structures formulae. All right, have you got that? Once again, isomers are organic compounds that have the same molecular formulae, but different structural formulae. Right, that's another important definition that you must highlight there. Please do not go to the exam without knowing that. That's very, very important. So question 2.4.2 says, 
write down the UPEC name of a possible chain isomer of compound B. Right. Now look at compound B. Compound B is 2-methylbutanel. Right. So we've got here 2 dash methyl, that's what we see, uh, butanel, butanel. Right, let me go to my visualizer now. Right, that's what we've got, 2 dash methyl butanel. The question says, write down a possible chain isomer. Now, remember, Gretos, the chain isomers simply move right, along the chain. That's all that's happening. It's just a movement along the chain. So methyl represents one carbon, right, one carbon. Bute represents four carbons, right? So let's look for something that has got five carbons. Now I can hear you even saying it. A possible answer would be pentanel. The penta indicates five carbons. You got that? So this is a possible correct answer there. All right. Alternatively, you could even move this one here. You could say, look, what about if you move it from two to three? Fine. No problem. Three dash methyl butanel. Right. Remember, it's just moving along the chain. So it's moving from two to three. And so the story goes. All right. So the either or, these are possible ones as well. Okay. Right. Let's go back to our question. The next question says, write down the UPEC name of a functional isomer of compound B. Now, remember, the functional isomers work in pairs, one can say. Right? Functional isomers work in pairs. Now, compound B... Remember, was 2 methyl butanel. All right. 2 methyl butanel. This is the all, that L represents the aldehyde. It's an aldehyde. That's the homologous series to which this belongs. Now, you learned during term one that the aldehydes always firm, uh, form functional isomers with the ketones, right? They are a pair, the ketones. So we need to look for a ketone that is a functional isomer of this. Well, that's very, very easy now. All we need to do now is we can say something because it's ketone, it must end with own, like this one, L, started with aldehyde and now ends with aldehyde. A possible one that we can use here is pentan dash two dash own, right? That is a possible functional isomer in connection with that. Remember, pent. Because there are five, there's one carbon plus four carbons. That's why we're going for pentan. There's the two, and there's the own, and there we go. All right, that's an easy way of getting that going. We can also take pentan dash three dash ohm. That's also correct, right? Remember, even with the previous one, we had the same situation, right? So there we have it. These are the functional isomers of this compound here. All right, there we go. Now we move on grade 12s. We are now at question 2.5. Wow, look how many marks we've scored. Question 2.5 says, a straight chain ester with seven carbons, right? Seven carbons, wow. Can be made from the positional isomer of compound C. All right, now let's look at compound C. Compound C has got one, two, three, four, five. Okay, so that is already pentanol. <laughs> can you see that? That's five of them there. Right, so now they're saying that an ester can be made from that. 
Now, let's just put a pause button here because we need to explain something. I'm going to go to my visualizer here. You may remember in term one that an alcohol plus a carboxylic acid, carboxylic acid, gives rise to an ester. You may remember this was uh, one of the practicals in term one plus water, right? That is one of the fundamental truths in organic chemistry, right? So let's remember this formula. Any alcohol plus or when reacted with any carboxylic acid will give rise to an ester plus water, all right? So we are going to use this guiding principle in taking us to the solution in connection with this question. Please make a note of this, grade 12s. If you haven't got this in your book, it's a very, very important one. It always comes up in the final examination for the National Senior Certificate, as well as the uh, supplementary exam as well. Right, so let's go back to our question now. The question says, a straight chain ester with seven carbons. Right, so I'm coming back here now, and the ester now has got seven carbons, right? The question is telling me that, okay? Seven carbons, right? That's for the ester. All right, let's go back now to the question. Uh, can be made from a positional isomer of compound C, right? Compound C. Now, compound C, as we can see there, has got five carbons with a hydroxyl group. So in a real sense, this one here now, all right? You go back to our visualizer. This has got five carbons. We're talking here of pentan dash one dash all, right? Or pentanol, let's call it that, right? Pentanol, right? Because there's five carbons there, right? It says five carbons. Now, the question says, write down the UPAC name and the condensed structural formula of the other organic reactant needed to make this ester? Oh, what a beautiful question. You see grade 12s, our answer becomes all the more easier because we've got this mind map in front of us. Let me ask you this question. What is seven minus five? Obviously it's two. So we're looking for a carboxylic acid that has got two carbons in it. Remember, ethanol, ethane has got two. So the carboxylic acid that has got two carbons in is known as ethanoic acid. Remember, ethanoic acid is a very important acid even in everyday life. Right? This is sometimes called acetic acid. It's found in vinegar as well. Right? Very, very important. So the correct answer there is ethanoic acid. Right? And of course, we know ethanoic acid is CH3 C double O H, right? In terms of a molecular formula, we know that that's the case, right? So any one of these will be on it. So now here's the deal. When we go back to the question, draw the structural formula of this ester. The question now shifts, right? The focus now shifts while we know ethanoic acid, right? We know pentanol. We now must find the ester. How do we draw that? Well, it's very, very easy now. Here we go. Here we are. So remember the alcohol plus the carboxylic acid right? It's going to give rise to an ester plus water. Let me draw the carboxylic acid. So I put my carbon here and my carbon here, right? And you know that there must be a hydrogen this side here and a hydrogen here because every carbon must be bonded to four hydrogens there. Now, because this is there, I must put an oxygen here. You remember that this is the functional group of the esters, and there must be an oxygen here. All right, so there is my ethanoic acid part. Okay, can you see? There's the two carbons there. Now I must stub that 
with these carbons here, right? Hydrogen, hydrogen, here we go. Hydrogen, hydrogen, there we go. Hydrogen, 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 hydrogen. Right, so let's check and see that everything is okay. Right, so what have we got? My paper, Mrs. De Villiers, can you see my paper clearly? Yes, we can. Okay, I'll just move this on the side. Okay, so what have we got here? Here we are, grade 12s. Here is our ester. Take note. Here we have our the part of the ester that is drawn from the carboxylic acid. Remember, now when we're drawing the structural formula, you must put that first. Okay, so that part must come first. And then the part that comes from the alcohol comes secondly, right? Now, here we have the two carbons from ethanoic acid, and there's the five, one, two, three, four, five, and there we have that, all right? So this, this particular ester here, right? The name of this ester, what do you think the name of this ester would be? Would anybody in the audience like to tell us? It's not on the question paper. Anybody like to tell us? Do we have a volunteer there, Mrs. Um, De Villiers? I'm keeping an eye on the chat. I see you have so many participants, Mr. Goldstone, but okay. no answers no, yet. No answers yet. Okay. All right. The name of this ester will be pentyl ethano Right, pentyl ethano eight plus water. All right, so just another question. It wasn't on the question paper, but just for enrichment and so on. Okay, so there we have it, grade twelves. Very very important. Remember the formula, as we can see, an alcohol plus carboxylic acid always gives rise to an ester plus water. And so when you are given uh, questions like this, where they say seven carbons, try and use this formula. But remember, now when you're drawing the structural formula, you must put the carboxylic acid first, and that must be followed by the alcohol. Very, very important. And make sure that all your carbons have got four bonds. Notice one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. So the story goes. Even here, be very careful here. Sometimes this is where the learners make mistakes. One, two, three, four. What about this one? One, two, three, four. So that carbon is satisfied there. Remember the oxygens just can have two, no problem, but the carbons must have four bonds. All right, very good. Right, now we come to the next question in our paper. I think this is the final one here, right? Compound D, compound D undergoes a combustion reaction according to the balanced equation below. Right, now grade 12, before we move on, let's just revise very quickly. Combustion. You may remember that the combustion of an alkane can have two parts, right? So you have the complete combustion of an alkane, complete combustion of an alkane, right? So in the complete combustion of any alkane, right, you're going to have the alkane, right, that is burnt in sufficient oxygen, right, o oxygen gas, obviously, right, sufficient oxygen, that's why it's complete, and that will give rise to carbon dioxide plus water, right, and one can say even heat as well, okay, but generally those are the two compounds. What I want you to recognize is for the complete combustion of an alkane, you get a carbon dioxide. All right. So this happens, you know, when uh, when we we take, uh, let's say, for example, a cigarette lighter, right? And you you flick the cigarette lighter because there's so much oxygen in the atmosphere, that propane gas in the cigarette lighter undergoes complete combustion. 
In other words, there's carbon dioxide that's formed as a product, as well as water as well. But the second type of uh, reaction is when there's incomplete combustion. Now, this takes place in motor vehicles, in the exhaust of a motor vehicle, right? Let's have a look at that. You see, when you have the incomplete combustion of an alkane, you're going to have the alkane, right? That is burnt in insufficient oxygen, right? This is insufficient. And that's what happens in the case of a motor vehicle. The product that is formed here is CO plus H2O, right? And of course, I think you know that. Motor vehicles produce carbon monoxide. The chemical formula for carbon monoxide is CO. So whenever you have a restricted amount or an insufficient amount of oxygen, when that alkane is burnt or undergoes combustion, that's what burning is, it's going to give rise to carbon monoxide plus water. Keep that in mind. You may want to make a note of this here. Now we need this for this particular question. Here we are. The question says the following, right? We go back to the question. The question says compound D. Now remember compound D was propyne. And there's the formula C3H4. And of course, combustion reactions can be the, the reaction either for an alkane, an alkene, or an alkyne. In this case, they chose an alkyne. It's the same principle. Take note, because there's complete combustion, it forms carbon dioxide. Right? If it was incomplete, it would be carbon monoxide. And these are all gases. Right? So the question says compound D undergoes a combustion reaction according to the balanced equation below. Right? So let me just write that equation down. We've got here now C3H4 plus four moles of oxygen gas. That goes to three moles of carbon dioxide plus two moles of water, right? And the, this is all, or steam, it's, it's in the gaseous phase, so it's obviously steam. They tell us the reaction happens at 100 degrees Celsius. That's nice to know. It's a very high temperature, right? And once again, that's talking to the fact that there's combustion. Great. The question that we now have to explore is calculate the total volume of the products when 50 cubic decimeters of compound D reacts with sufficient oxygen. Notice, even the question is agreeing with us that sufficient oxygen gives rise to carbon dioxide. Very good. This is a lovely, lovely question. Now, grade 12s, take note, they say 50 cubic decimeters of compound D. All right, now let me go to my visualizer screen because I've got the reaction right here. They've given me another piece of information. They've told us that, look, this guy here, in terms of a gas volume, right? They've said 50 cubic decimeters, right? And what they want to know is how much of this plus how much of that. These are the reactants, right? They want to know how much this plus how much of that okay in other words carbon dioxide there we go can you see that that's what this question is exploring now very easy the way to solve this grade 12 is very very easy remember in chemistry whenever you are stuck run to the mole ratio that takes you uh, it's like it's like the master key, the skeleton key. It is the way to go, the mole ratio. Now I'm going to do that. Let me explore the mole ratio that exists between propyne and carbon dioxide first. Now, there we go. So let's have a look. One mole of this compound here, propyne, can you see that? You agree that there's a one here, right? Reacts with or gives rise to Three moles of that, that's carbon dioxide. And do you notice that one mole of this 
compound, right, propane, gives rise to two moles of water in its gaseous form. Now, if one mole is 50 cubic decimeters, they tell me that, what is three times 50? I can hear you saying it. Yes. One, five, zero cubic decimeters by virtue of the mole ratio, right? The mole ratio is helping us get to the answer. Very important. In a similar manner, if one mole of propane reacts so that it forms two moles of water in its gaseous phase, according to the balanced reaction, that means 50 cubic decimeters is going to give rise here to, what's two times 50? 100 cubic decimeters. So I'm ready for my answer. Therefore, the question now, and remember grade 12, always go back to your question. The question says, calculate the total volume of the products. That's what we need to write. Right, therefore, the total volume of the products, very easy, is equal to, right? There's the products. 150 cubic decimeters plus, because there's a plus, 100 EM3. What is the answer? What's 150 cubic decimeters plus 100 cubic decimeters? None other than 250 cubic decimeters. There's my final answer right here. All right. Have we got that grade 12s? Very, very important. Very briefly, let me just go through this again. Once again, you write out your balanced equation. Then you also put down what you are given from the question. They say, look, 50 cubic decimeters of propane is given, and they want us to find how much, what is the volume of carbon dioxide? What is the, the volume of water? These are the products. Well, we run to the mole ratio. Remember I said that? And according to the mole ratio, the balance reaction shows that one mole of this reacts to three moles of that. That means if there's 50 cubic decimeters, the mole ratio will yield 150 cubic decimeters. And if there's 50 cubic decimeters, apologies about that, that will give two of those, which is 100. When I add these two figures together, my final answer is 250 cubic decimeters. There we go. Right, grade 12, can you believe it? That was question number two, the first question there. All right, now we're going to go on to our next question, which explores the physical properties of organic compounds. Okay, all right, so grade 12, here we are, the physical properties of organic compounds. Here, this question, remember the physical properties, as you know, Physical properties are boiling point, melting point, and vapor pressure. Please, grade 12, from your exam guidelines, make sure you know those definitions, those words, very important. One of them will come up. In fact, more than one will come up. They use them in an interchanging fashion. We'll see in this question. So make sure you know those definitions. All right. So this question reads, the table below shows a number of organic compounds and their respective boiling points. There we have it. All right. So remember the physical properties, if ever you're given a graph or whatever, the physical property will always be your dependent variable. It will always be on the y-axis. Just keep that in mind. All right. In, of course, in this case, the molar mass, that's your independent variable. So the question says, study the table and then answer the questions which follow. We have methane, ethane, propane, butane. Then we have methyl propane, right? And then ethanol, there's the, al the aldehyde, and ethanol, there's the alcohol. All right, 
Right. And you know um, from your studies in chemistry, ethanol, that's the smell that we can detect, you know, when someone has been drinking alcohol, you know, you can tell that's ethanol, right? And that's what the police use when they're stopping drivers and testing the breathalyzer test and so on. It's an ethanol test and so on. All right, so there we have it. So we've got our compounds. We've got their molar masses. Now let's look at the molar masses. We've got 16, 30, 44, 58. Look at that butane. And look at methyl propane. That's also 58. That's interesting. And then ethanol is 44. Ooh, there's a bit of a dip there. And ethanol is 46. That's very interesting. But now look at their boiling points. My goodness, minus 161,6 degrees. Ay, ay, ay. Sounds like a Gauteng temperature over this past weekend. Oh, dear. Anyway, minus 89 degrees, minus 42, minus 1, minus 11. Then we have 20,2 and then 79. Right. So very interesting statistics that we are given. Now, question 3.1. Define the term boiling point. Would someone in our virtual audience, one of the great 12s, like to define boiling point for us? So great 12s, as you know, Boiling point is defined as the temperature. Please don't write it's the point at which. No, 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 no. That's wrong. It's the temperature. You must write temperature. It's the temperature at which the vapor pressure of a liquid is equal to its atmospheric pressure. Very, very important. Okay. Now, question 3.2. Which one? compound from A to G will be liquid at room temperature, right? Now, grade 12s, this is a very easy question. Look, room temperature is 25 degrees Celsius, right? Compound A disqualifies itself because compound A boils at minus 161,6 degrees. That's nowhere near 25 degrees. Compound B also disqualifies. C is disqualified. E is also disqualified. What about compound F? That's still not 25 degrees. Can you see that? This compound F boils at 20,2 degrees. So the only one, the only correct answer is G. Why? Because G will boil at 79 degrees. Hence, at 25 degrees, it is still liquid at room temperature. All right. Have we got that, Great Twelves? So you need to know when do these boil and what is room temperature and so on and so forth. Now, question 3.3. Explain why the boiling point of compound E is lower than that of compound D <coughs> by referring to the intermolecular forces present and the energy involved, right? Compound E and compound D, right? Why is the boiling point lower? Notice the boiling point of compound E is minus 11,7 which is much less than minus one, as you know, from the number line as well, right? So we wanna know why. Well, here's the deal. Let me go to my visualizer and let's now try and jot this down. Right, so compound, let's just get our bearings correct. Compound D, <clears throat> sorry, thank you, can I have a page? Thanks. So compound D is butane. Right? We are told that D is butane. And compound E is methyl propane. All right. Now, let's have a look. All right, so there we've got it. This is um, De Villiers. Can you see my visualizer? Yes, yes, we can. Okay, all right, fine. Now, grade 12s, boiling points all are rigged around intermolecular forces. 
right? So butane, in terms of intermolecular forces, I'm just going to put your IMF. Let's talk about them first. Butane has London forces. London forces. What about the intermolecular forces of methyl propane? Well, this is uh, an alkyl, um, you know, uh, so this also has London forces. London forces as well. Because it belongs to the same, in a sense, the same homologous series, but there's an alkyl group attached to that alkane as well. All right? So both of them have got London forces. Okay? That's very interesting. What about now when we look at the fact that, yeah, we are. Okay, there we are. What about the branching? Oh, dear. This one here is more branched. This is a straight chain, one can call it. All right? So these are points. We're going to need these. Very important. Okay, methylpropane is more branched. Butane is just a straight model like that. Okay, so how do we go about answering the question? Well, now that we've planned our work, let's work our plan. Compound E, right? Compound E, I'm just going to do it like that, is more branched than... Compound D. Right? That's one main point. Notice I'm using my schemata just to formulate my points. They both contain the same intermolecular forces. However, this compound E has weaker. Uh, intermolecular forces, uh, London forces. Then D. Right? Although both of them have got London forces, these London forces are weaker than those London forces. The reason for that is, this is a straight-chained molecule. What about this one? This is more branched. As a result of that, therefore, less energy is needed to overcome the weaker Intermolecular forces, please don't do this in the exam. I'm just taking a shortcut now. In compound E, then in D. All right. Okay. Are we all together? Right. Let's just go through this again. We've got butane. We've got methylpropane. They both have London forces. Butane is a straight chain molecule. Methylpropane is more branched. By virtue of the fact that methylpropane is more branched, that means the intermolecular forces in compound E in the methylpropane are weaker than the intermolecular forces in compound D. That means that less energy is needed to overcome the weaker intermolecular forces in compound E than in compound D. And that's how that question is properly answered. All right? If you go back to the question again, notice what it says there. Explain why the boiling point of compound E is lower than that of compound D, right? And all of that. And that would explain, because less energy, that's why the boiling point of compound E is lower than that. Now, here we have the next question. 
Next question states, explain the difference in the boiling points of compounds F and G by referring to the intermolecular forces present and the energy involved, right? F and G, right? So let's now talk about the aldehydes and let's talk about the alcohols, right? Compound F, as we can see, is ethanol, ethanol, and compound G is ethanol, ethanol, okay? Right, so let's now have a look at this. Grade 12s, would someone in our audience like to tell us what homologous series is ethanol, does ethanol belong to? Um, we have an answer, and the answer is aldehyde. Well done. Well done. Excellent. Aldehyde. Yes, that's an aldehyde. What about ethanol? There's the clue here. Ethanol is an alcohol. Well done. Very nice. Alcohol. All right. Take note, great twelves. When you plan your work, you're able to work your plan. Well done. Well done. Very nice. So. The aldehydes, remember, have intermolecular forces. I'm just going to write here IMF, right? Aldehydes. They have London forces. Don't forget that. They also have dipole dipole forces, right? Those two types, only those two. What about the alcohols? IMF, intermolecular forces. They have three. They have London forces. Then they have dipole dipole forces. And they also have strong hydrogen. Okay, these are the intermolecular forces that these compounds have. Huh? Now, how do we proceed from here? Well, the, we first state the intermolecular forces for compound F are London forces and dipole dipole forces. The intermolecular forces for compound G are London forces, dipole dipole forces and strong hydrogen bonds, right? There we go. Now, what are we saying? The hydrogen bonds are stronger than these other intermolecular forces, right? So hydrogen bonds are stronger than Dipole dipole forces right? as a result, more energy will be needed to overcome. the intermolecular forces in ethanol than in ethanol. That's it. All right. Are we all together? Let's go through this again. Step number one. We have to identify the homologous series to which each compound belongs, right? Ethanol is an aldehyde. You told us that. Well done, great twelves. Ethanol is an alcohol. All the aldehydes have London forces and dipole dipole forces. The, the alcohols have London forces, 
dipole-dipole forces and strong hydrogen bonds. That means that hydrogen bonds are stronger than dipole-dipole forces. You see, these don't have hydrogen bonds. Therefore, more energy will be needed to overcome the intermolecular forces in ethanol than in ethanol. All right, so that's how we go from there. We're now at our last two questions on this. 3.5, a learner wants to investigate the effect that the functional group has on the boiling point of different homologous series. Which one of the alkanes, A to E, will ensure a fair test? Now, grade 12s, just make a note of this. The definition of a fair test in chemistry is that is an ex that is an investigation, a scientific investigation in which there is only one independent variable. Please keep that in mind. There's only one independent variable. And so which one, A, is it methane, ethane, propane, butane, methyl propane, will ensure a fair test when compared to compounds F and G? The only, the only correct answer is option C, and that is propane. That's the only one that will ensure a fair test. None of the others will do that. And then finally, question 3.6, which substance A, B, or C will have the highest vapor pressure? Well, we know how vapor pressure works. When you have a high boiling point, you have a very low vapor pressure. When you have a low boiling point, you have a very high vapor pressure. Looking at the table, look at the boiling point of methane. It's the lowest in the table. Hence, the answer for 3.6. While methane has the lowest boiling point, it will have the highest vapor pressure. All right. So there we go, grade 12s. That's been our question on the physical properties of organic compounds. Make sure you know your definitions of boiling point, melting point, and vapor pressure, as well as all the other points related to this as well. Those learners who were part of the BOT program, the Back on Track program, you know that there were sessions in which we handled these concepts. So go over your revision notes there. There was some valuable information that was discussed, and that will really make you succeed in the final examination. We're now going to move on to question number four, which is the reactions related to our organic compounds. So grade 12s, here we are, the reactions, right? Now, just before we go into reactions, I think it's just important. What I'd like to do is I'd just like to sketch something on the visualizer, all right? Grade 12s, remember, when it comes to reactions, right? I'm just going to do a, a little schemata. Let's start here with the alkanes. Let me put the alkanes on top. Alkanes, right? And this side, I'm gonna put the alkenes. And at the bottom here, I'm gonna put the alcohols. And this side, I'm going to put the halo alkanes. Halo alkanes. Okay, let's say alkanes. There we go. All right. Now, watch carefully, Great Twelves. When an alkene becomes an alkane, there is an addition reaction. Right? You know that. You must know that. And the type of addition reaction is known as hydrogenation, right? When an alkane becomes a halo alkane, right? That is a substitution reaction. All right? And of course, that type of substitution reaction is called halogenation, right? When a haloalkane becomes an alcohol, 
That's also a substitution reaction. So this side of the sketch involves the substitution reactions, right? That's a nice, easy way of remembering that. When an alcohol becomes an alkene, well, that's an elimination reaction, right? Because the hydroxyl group is eliminated, right? And when it becomes this side here, it's called dehydration. Right? There we go. All right. Are we all together? Now, when an alkene becomes an alcohol, right, that is now an addition reaction because the double bonds are broken. And this is a hydration reaction. There's water that's added. That's why you're going to have the alcohol, you know, the hydroxyl group there. That's a hydration reaction. All right. But what about these two here? Oh, these are interesting. Right. And what about when this becomes that side here? You see, when an alkane, an alkene becomes a halo alkane, something is added that is called right that reaction is hydro hello genation and it falls under the umbrella of an addition reaction right so the type of reaction here is hydrohalogenation when a halo alkane becomes an alkene Ooh, that's an elimination reaction. And the type of elimination reaction is dehydrohalogenation. What a mouthful. That's a real grade 12 word, right? Dehydrohalogenation. Grade 12s, in a real sense, this is the bedrock of chemistry. I can add one little detail, right? That when you have this substitution reaction, yeah, you may also want to indicate that this is hydrolysis. Right? So that's a little detail. This sketch is not my very own. I can assure you that. This sketch occurs in the textbook Study and Master. If you have the Study and Master textbook, you'll find the sketch there. It is a very helpful tool. All you need to do now is to ensure that you're putting in your reaction conditions in connection with how these things work. Now, you'll notice that this is a sketch that we can refer to many, many times in question number four. All right. So remember your umbrella reactions now. You have addition, you have elimination, and you have substitution. Now, that doesn't mean to say that those are the only reactions in chemistry. No, there are many others. However, for organic chemistry at grade 12 level, we are concerned with these reactions, and this is the sketch that can guide us to success. Now, let's go back to our question. The question says, the flow diagram represents our compound X can be used as a starting reactant to prepare different compounds, right? There we have compound X, and we have reaction A, and there we have C386. Oh, dear. And there we have plus another C386. And then we have another compound, and so the story goes, right? So now we have to figure out how this whole story goes. Let's just look and see what we, what we also find interesting here. Right, so take note. Here we have a four-carbon alkane, they tell us. And you know, four-carbon alkane, hmm. Does that not sound like butane? Butane has four carbons. So compound V is probably butane. You never know. But let's not jump the gun. All right? We see here water plus sulfuric acid. Oh, nice. Sulfuric acid, that is a dehydrating um, agent. Wow, very nice. Okay. Then we have compound Y, the major product. Reaction D, that's all very cryptic at this stage. Compound Z, major product. 
Oh, that's full. For, oh, no. Okay. And look at this sodium bromide. Even the halogens are involved to some extent here. Oh, my goodness. That's And what is this? Oh, that. That is an alkene because it's got a double bond. Oh, very nice. Alkene. Very nice. An alkene plus bromine. Oh, that looks like where your alkene, as we see here, right? Your alkene is going toward the halo alkane. But let's not jump the gun. Let's now go back to our question. The first question says, explain 4.1.1. They say that compound X undergoes cracking in reaction A, right? So remember, notice there's compound X broken up into this piece, into that piece, and into that piece. Explain what is meant by a cracking reaction. Would anybody like to tell us what do they think a cracking reaction is? Great walls, feel free. Any volunteers? Right, so cracking, the correct answer is cracking is the chemical process in which longer chain hydrocarbon molecules are broken down into shorter useful molecules, right? Have you got that great toss? So cracking is where longer chain hydrocarbon molecules are broken down into smaller or shorter, more useful molecules. Please keep that in mind. You may know from your studies in chemistry that there are two types of cracking. You have thermal cracking, that's when heat is used or energy is used, and then you have Catalytic cracking, that's where catalysts are used without the catalyst undergoing any part of the reaction and so on. It's just to speed up the reaction, All right? So keep that in mind. Now, write down the molecular formula of compound X. Now, grade 12s, watch carefully. I've got here, I'm going to draw it. All right. We've got this. Then we have here, we first told... That that's C3A6 plus another one, C3A6, right? Plus, and there we have that. Right, now let me show you on my visualizer. Right, we're looking for this one here. We've got C3A6 plus C3A6. And they tell us that this one is a four-carbon alkane. Remember, the alkanes have got the formula CnH2n plus 2. Remember that? Right. So there are four of them. So my hydrogens, what's 2 times 4? 8 plus 2, 10. Right, that is butane. Right, now let me count. How many carbons have I got? I've got three. I've got three. Three plus three is six. Plus another four is ten. So yeah, I'm going to have C10. What about my hydrogens? I've got six plus six is twelve. Twelve plus ten, twenty-two. That's H22. There's my answer. The correct answer is C10. H22. Do we notice how we get that grade 12s? You simply use your knowledge of alkanes, the general formula of the alkanes. You're given the biggest clue that that is a four carbon alkane, and then you work backwards to get your answer. That is the correct answer. By the way, just for information's sake, this compound is called decane. Just a little piece of interesting information, okay? It's not really necessary to know that, but in case for enrichment, you may want to read up later on about that. Very, very interesting, decade. All right, so there we have it. That's our first answer. Now going back to our question paper, 4.1.2, uh, 4.1.3 now. Is compound V, right, compound V, 
is it saturated or unsaturated? Well, here we have our compound B. Compound B, there it is here. Butane is a saturated hydrocarbon. Reason? They are single bonds between the carbon and the hydrogen atoms. Don't just write there, they are single bonds. No, great twelves. They are single bonds between the carbon and the hydrogen atoms as well. All right, so please keep that in mind. That's why it's a saturated hydrocarbon. Okay, all right, we're making good headway. Now they tell us compound Z, there's it at the bottom, you can see it, is a halo alkane, right? A halo alkane. Then they say, consider reaction B and reaction C. <laughs> okay, write down the type of reaction that takes place at B. So now notice what's happening, right? From here, right, from here, this is going to give rise to a halo alkane, right? Here's my chart. See, once you've got this, now I come back to this. When a, an alkene, that's an alkene, you see, that's an alkene. That's another alkene, right? According to the diagram, the alkene has become a halo alkane. Look what we've got. You see how this sketch is helping us now? The alkene becoming a halo alkane. The answer is it's an addition reaction. What type of addition reaction? Hydrohalogenation. If you put any one of these two answers, you'll get your full marks for that, right? Remember the umbrella reaction is addition. The type of addition reaction is hydrohalogenation. Are we together, Great Twelves? Do you notice how this sketch is helping us in understanding what's going on and how we can get our marks? Very, very important. Okay, so the correct answer there is that it's hydrohalogenation, or if you put addition, that's also fine. Now we go back to our question. Our question says the following. Write down the UPAC name of compound Z. Oh, that's easy. Look, what we need now, we need to recognize that here is sodium bromide. You see, that's the big clue, sodium bromide. So there's obviously the injection of bromine somewhere. That's the, hal the halogen that we're involved with. This one here is pro right? Propine, prop uh, propine, yeah, there we go, propine, I'm doing a pardon, propine. So we've got here a situation where we've got here's our answer, two dash bromopropane. Remember, that halogen, like we saw in a previous question, will never attach itself to the first carbon. It will always be between or glycosally in between. And that's why we say two dash, won't be one dash. You got that? So the correct answer there is two dash bromopropane. That's the halo alkane that was formed from the alkene. All right, and there we go. Okay, now let's move on. We are now at question 4.3. Let me just move this out of the way for a second here. There we go. All right, now they say, consider reaction to prepare compound Y. Compound Y is this one here. All right, there we go. Write down the homologous series to which compound Y belongs. I now need my sketch. It's very difficult. I personally find it very, very difficult to actually negotiate this thing, right? Without the sketch. Oops, sorry. Next one. Yeah, there we go. Right. So we add the halo alkane. Can you see that? Halo alkane. This one here must relate to this 
Remember, this is also in its reversible reaction here like that. That's where the hydrolysis comes in as well. So the homologous series that's related to this is none other than alcohols. It's an alcohol, all right? That's the correct answer there. If you look at that compound there, your compound Y has its major product uh, as an alcohol. Now, the reaction, uh, the next question says 4.3.2, use structural formulae Ooh, nice. for the organic compound. Write down a balanced equation for this reaction. All right. Now, that's very, very interesting. Right. So, we are going to show how an alkene plus water and so on and so forth gives rise to all of this. So, how do we do that? Here we are. Thank you very much. This is how we approach that grade 12, as you know. Right. We're going to start by saying, look, we've got this alkene that has a double bond. Right. And let me put the hydrogens here. I'll put a hydrogen here, hydrogen here. I'm always very careful to make sure that my carbons are all satisfied. There must be one hydrogen here. And then this now must come to another carbon. And there we have that. We have the three of them here, right? There we go, there we go, there we go. All right, so one, two, three. Remember it was C3, oh, sorry. Apologies, you couldn't see that. I was writing, all right. So C3H6, one, two, three, four, five, six. Remember that was the compound we had there, C3H6. Remember that? All right, so there we have it. Now, this is reacted with water. I'm going to say yeah, plus H2O. Okay, we react that with water. And then we use a catalyst as a dehydrating agent, H2SO4. They tell us that, right? They tell us that. If you look very, very carefully, here we see it, right here. There we have it, right there, okay? So we're not just imagining things. We're taking it from the diagram itself. So what does that give rise to? Well, very easy. The compound that we are given that it gives rise to is the following, carbon, carbon, carbon. We have our three carbons. Then we have our hydrogen, hydrogen, hydrogen. Yeah. Okay, there's my one, two, three, four. And this one here must be my hydroxyl group like that. And then this one must have its hydrogen, hydrogen, hydrogen. What about here? One more hydrogen. Right, one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, yeah, one, two, three, four. Everything is satisfied. All right, so there we have it. Okay, there we have the reaction that we need to write up. Do you notice? There's my hydroxyl group. Please, grade 12, don't put one and then put OH. No, no, no. You must put dash O, dash H there, and so on. Separate it nicely. That is the catalyst, remember? Sulfuric acid in chemistry, it makes a great catalyst. You probably saw that in your first term um, preparation of Esther's practical investigation, right? Sulfuric acid is a dehydrating, it has dehydrating properties, and that's why it's used to maximum effect in organic chemistry. All right, good. So there's the structural formula. Very, very nice. Now, question 4.4, right? Consider reaction D. They say write down the type of reaction that needs to take place to prepare compound Z from compound Y, right? Compound Z, compound Y. So now, <clears throat> here's my compound Z to compound Y. Right, compound Z to compound Y, right? When we think about this, everybody, compound Z to compound Y, if we look at our compounds here, what is our compound Z? Well, did we meet the UPAC name? Remember, that's bromopropane, right? Bromopropane, and from compound Z, right? Compound Z is bromopropane, all of that. So that reaction, 
based on our sketch here, the halo alkane there, and there we have the alcohol. Remember, that's a substitution reaction, right? And once again, that would be hydrohalogenation as well, okay? All right, as I said, this is the substitution part. Right, this is the substitution side of the diagram. Okay, so there we have it. So when we look at that question there, question 4.1, write down the type of reaction that needs to take place to prepare compound Z from compound Y. The answer is substitution. You can also say, being more specific, hydrohalogenation, and so on. Now, 4.4.2, besides heat, write down the other reaction conditions needed for compound D. Well, very interesting. For compound D, the other reactions that are needed, right, will be, <clears throat> as you've seen, you can use hydrogen bromide, or, as they show in the sketch, sodium bromide plus concentrated acid and concentrated H2SO4, sulfuric acid. Right? Those are the reaction conditions. All right. Very, very important. Remember, in the sketch I mentioned, just fill in those reaction conditions. They're very, very easy to remember. Right? The main thing are those reaction types and so on. Very important. Now, finally, consider reaction C. Reaction C. There we have reaction C. This one, yeah. Right, reaction C. Besides dissolving compound Z in ethanol and placing the reactants over heat under reflux, Write down the other reaction condition needed. Oh, that's very easy. You, all you need, you need a concentrated base. And the concentrated base that is very good to use is sodium hydroxide, right? So to answer that one, strong base. Can also write concentrated. Sodium hydroxide, right? This is talking nicely to our acids and bases section as well. All right, so that's the reaction condition that's needed. Great 12s, that has been question number four, the organic reactions. Remember, we started our program this morning by looking at naming of organic compounds. We went then to a question that revolved around um, the physical properties of organic compounds, the boiling point, melting point, vapor pressure. Now we've just handled a question that has dealt with organic reactions. Very, very important. And once again, grade 12s, may I stress to you the use of this particular schemata. There are others that are used. I know even in Mind the Gap, that brilliant study guide that the Department of Basic Education has produced for grade 12s, also very nice sketching of the whole scene. Personally, I like this one because it makes a lot of sense to me, you know, and it's easy to follow. It's circular and the arrows go in certain directions. As I mentioned, the only thing you need to do, in fact, things you need to remember and not forget are the reaction conditions for the various types of reactions. OK, so there we have it very nicely.
reaction rate is the change in concentration. You can also say the change in amount. You can also say the change in number of moles or the volume or the mass, right? But let's stick with concentration. The change in concentration of the reactants or the products per unit time. Have we got that grade 12s? Once again, the change in concentration of the reactants or the products per unit time. Very, very important definition. So make sure from the examination guidelines that you have got that one firmly memorized as well. Question 5.2. Mention two ways to increase the rate of hydrogen gas production in the above mentioned reaction, excluding temperature. <laughs> That's very clever, right? Excluding temperature. Now, the way to increase the rate of hydrogen gas production, what we can do, number one, we can use powdered zinc instead of the zinc granules. You remember that? Because as you know from reaction rate, a granule has got a smaller surface area than a powder. Powders have large surface areas. That's why the rate of reaction is increased like you cannot believe. All right? So one of the options is use powdered zinc instead of zinc granules. Another one. We can use a suitable catalyst. That's how we can increase the production of hydrogen gas. There's a third way. We can make use of a more concentrated hydrochloric acid solution. So while you see here, that's dilute. One of the ways is make sure that this is concentrated hydrochloric acid. You'll get more hydrogen gas being produced. If this is zinc powder, you'll get more hydrogen gas produced. Okay, very good. So keep those points in mind. Now, question 5.3. Give a reason why equilibrium will not be reached in the flask. Oh, well, look at this. What did they tell us? They, we are told that this is an open flask, hence this is not a closed system, right? As a result, the hydrogen gas will escape. And once again, this is not even a reversible reaction as well. There's another point. Right, so if you got those details, equilibrium will not be reached because this is not a closed system, right? The hydrogen gas escapes and so on. And even the reaction it goes in one direction. It's not a reversible reaction. That's why equilibrium will not be reached. All right, fine. Now, there we go. Question 5.4. The mass of the zinc was recorded every 10 seconds from the start of the reaction. The results of the experiment are shown below. Now, notice the time. We've got 0, 10, 20, 30, 40, right up to 80. Then the mass of zinc, we've got this X here. And we've got 85, 76, 68, 62, 57, 52, 52, another 52. They say the initial mass of zinc is X grams. So that X stands for a certain number, like these numbers here. Question. According to the data in the table above, which reactant is in excess? Give a reason for your answer. What would you say, Great Twelves? Which of these reactants is in excess? Give a reason for your answer. Is it the Well, it's the zinc. It's the zinc. The reason for that is there is zinc that has been unreacted. It hasn't reacted, left over in the flask. In other words, all the zinc is not used up. Follow that? So that's why zinc is the reactant in excess. That's the answer to question 5.4. Now, over to you, grade 12s. 5.5. 5. 
the average rate of the reaction in the first 40 seconds, right, the first 40 seconds is 0 0.875 grams per second. Calculate the initial mass of zinc, right? And they give us five marks for that. Okay. What I'm going to do, grade 12s, I'm going to give you a few minutes, right? I'll give you four minutes to calculate that. All right. And then we will review. All right. So the question here, 5.5, says the average rate of the reaction for the first 40 seconds is 0, 0,875. I'm just going to make a note of this on my paper. The average rate of reaction uh, in the first 40 seconds, right, is equal to 0, 0,875 grams per second. All right, and then they say calculate the value of X is equal to something. Okay, now. Yep.
Now, grade 12s, very important. When we are looking for a reactant, remember in a chemical equation, there are reactants and products. Whenever we are finding a reactant, and this is the case, you must always put a negative in front here. I'm putting it here in a different color so that you see I put my negative there. You got that? Right. So now I continue. My figures will all be the same, however, that negative influences quite a bit. So my reaction rate, right, reaction rate will be equal to negative delta M Z N, right? The change in the mass of the zinc divided by delta T, right? And our figures remain the same. We were given 0, 0,875, 0, 0, oh, so 0,875. That's equal to negative. And there we have our 65, was it? 62. Minus our X, that's what we're looking for. That's the reactant, you see? That's why this had to be negative. And there we had 40 minus zero. Right. Now, if we have to simplify this in a real sense, we're going to multiply. This is going to be minus, and let's say 62 minus X over 40. What I'm going to do, I'm going to cross multiply. I'm going to cross multiply this by negative 40. So 0, 0,875 multiplied by negative 40 is equal to 62 minus x. This here now, right, on the calculator is going to give me a negative 35, right? And then I've got here 62 minus x. I'm going to bring this minus x over. It becomes positive. You know that. And then according to the laws of algebra, I take this over, and that's going to be positive 35. Right? We're using the additive inverses, whichever way you want to reason. 62 plus 35, the value of x is none other than 97 grams. Now, let's see why this is the perfect answer compared to what I calculated earlier on, the 27 grams. Right, let's go to our table. Here we had our table, right? So look at this. The mass of zinc at the start, how could it ever be 27 and then suddenly jump to 85 and then come, to, it's just illogical. Can you see how impossible it is that the final answer is 27? So once again, grade 12s, using your power of reason, checking your answer, right? Not second guessing it, but checking to see that it makes sense, that it's valid. Now we come to the final conclusion, right? That 97 grams, is obviously the way to go in terms of its mass by virtue of the fact that it starts at 97 grams, then, and then it's, as time elapses, then we have the mass getting less and less and less. All right, All right. So please remember grade 12s, once again, when you're calculating your reactants, you must put a negative there. If you're calculating your products, it's going to be a positive. So that's the only thing that will change. And then, as we saw, that's the whole scene. All right, there we go. Right, now let's move on with our question. All right, now grade 12s, here we are. The figure below shows the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution curves for the reaction above at two different temperatures. All right, now notice there's T1 right up there, and there's T2 right up there. The activation energy for this reaction is also indicated on the graph. There we have the activation energy. Which temperature is higher? Write down only T1 or T2. There is an answer saying T1. 
right? Well, T1 does not represent the higher temperature. T2 is actually the correct answer, all right? So the correct answer there for 5.6 is T2, okay? So the reason for that is if you look at the activation energy, you'll notice there is a greater number of molecules here that can actually take part in the reaction as well compared to T1. Can you see T1 is this blue part? But if you look at this, there's an increase. So that means that T2 is the higher temperature, right? This represents an increase in temperature here. Okay, don't look at the crest and say, this one is higher than that one. No, it's, what about, it's about what's happening here in terms of activation energy and so on. All right, so please keep that in mind. Now, write down the name of the theory used to explain how reactions occur at molecular level. Who'd like to give us that comment? What theory do we use? Right, the answer there is the collision theory. Right, you probably remember that from your textbooks and your teacher mentioning that. So the collision theory explains how reactions occur at molecular level. Now question 5.8, referring to the shaded areas in the distribution curves provided, use the theory, the collision theory, to explain how an increase in temperature affects the reaction rate, right? Increase in temperature affects the reaction rate. Now I'm going to summarize points for you, right? Here is how we do that. Very, very easy. I'm just going across to my visualizer now. Okay. Can you see my paper, Mrs. De Villiers? Yes, we can, sir. All right, great. So step number one, grade 12, the first point. A temperature increase. Right? When you increase the temperature, you will increase the average kinetic energy of the particles. A temperature increase will result in an increase in the average. kinetic energy of the particles, right? That's point number one. And we know that that's the case. Remember, even the definition of temperature is it's the measure of the average kinetic energy of the particles in a substance. That's why when you boil a kettle, you put tap water in a kettle, you switch the kettle on, and when the kettle reaches boiling point, sometimes you'll actually find that the kettle is even shaking because those particles inside the kettle have got so much kinetic energy that they're bombarding right, the sides of the container. And as a result of that, that is an indication of the temperature that they've reached. All right, so that's it. So that's our first point. The temperature increase, will result in an increase in the average kinetic energy of the particles. That's point number one. Now, as a result, more particles will have an EK, kinetic energy, which is greater than the activation energy. Right? Very, very important point. And as a result of that, more effective collisions per unit 
time will occur or will result. All right. Have you got those three points? Here they are. To summarize, as you can see, an increase in temperature will result in an increase in the average kinetic energy of the particles of a substance. This means that more particles will now have a kinetic energy that is greater than the activation energy. As a result, more effective collisions will occur per unit time. All right. Have you got those points, grade 12? Very, very important. So the collision theory explains how reactions occur at molecular level. Now, grade 12, we are in chemical equilibrium, right? This is the deep water of the paper, as you know. The balanced chemical reaction below represents one of the steps in the industrial preparation of ammonia. As you may know, this is known as the Harbour process. Some books call it the Harbour-Bosch process. It's an exothermic reaction, very, very famous reaction. The reaction takes place in a closed container, that's nice, and reaches equilibrium, also nice, at 380 Kelvin. Nice to know, Kelvin. Right. Now, question 6.1. Define the term chemical equilibrium. So chemical equilibrium, grade 12s, right, is defined as the stage in a reversible reaction where the rate of the forward reaction equals the rate of the reverse reaction, right? We shouldn't just say where the forward reaction e is equal to the reverse reaction. No, 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 no. Chemical equilibrium is defined as the stage in a reversible reaction where the rate of the forward reaction is equal to the rate of the reverse reaction. All right. Very important. Now, 6.2. Grade 12s, we're going to break here for some time because this is a calculation that you can work on as well. Let's read through the question first. The question says, initially, four moles of nitrogen gas and an unknown mass X of hydrogen gas are sealed in a two cubic decimeter flask and allowed to reach equilibrium. At equilibrium, the concentration of the ammonia gas Present in the flask is 1,5 mole per cubic decimeter. The Kc value at this temperature is 1,8. Calculate the initial mass of the hydrogen gas present in the flask. You know that a question like this can reach anywhere from 7 to 9 marks, right? So they, that indicates not difficulty, but just the steps involved and so on. All right, so grade 12, let's review question 6.2. Okay, remember the question reads, initially four moles of nitrogen gas and an unknown mass X of hydrogen gas are sealed in a two cubic decimeter flask and allowed to reach equilibrium. At equilibrium, the concentration of the ammonia gas present in the flask is 1,5 mole per cubic decimeter. The Kc at this temperature is 1,8. Calculate the initial mass of the hydrogen present in the flask. Now, as you may know, grade 12, your teacher probably told you in your textbooks that you've used, in a calculation like this, we make use of what's called the rice table, or some books call it the ice table, right? Depending on which way it is. Now, there are at least three ways that one can approach this, right? I'm just gonna show you uh, this. Right, here's one of the ways that we can approach. It. This is the first option. If we use the number of moles, remember we are concerned with what's happening here, right? That's our X, that's the hydrogen gas. Now, this solution shows more or less what the answer is. 
The final answer is 13 grand. Okay, but now let's just reason this out. The question said initially. So we put a four there because it was the number of moles at the start. Are we together, grade 12? And then we know, according to the balanced equation, obviously there is no product form, so there's no moles. So we put a zero here. This will still carry our x. You got that? So we have four here, we have our x here, and there we have zero here. Now, they tell us also that the concentration of the ammonia at equilibrium is 1,5, right? So we told that that's the case. Concentration is 1,5 uh, mole per cubic decimeter. So we put that in here. Based on the whole principle here, we know, according to the formula, C is equal to N over V. I'm just going to go across to my visualizer now here, right? If you look at what we've got here now, in conjunction with that, because you may be wondering, where do these numbers come from? We are given the concentration is 1,5 mole per cubic decimeter. We're given the volume is 2 cubic decimeters. Right. Remember the formula in chemistry, concentration is equal to the number of moles divided by the volume. Right. We learned that in grade 10, we took it to grade 11, and now in grade 12, we're still using this important formula. So when we substitute into this formula, we're going to have 1,5 is equal to the number of moles divided by the volume is 2. When I cross product, I've got 1,5 multiplied by 2, and that's equal to N. So N is equal to 3 mole, right? That's an important principle. So remember this 3 now. So I go back here now. Uh, oops. Sorry about that. Here we go. Here we go. All right. Okay. So there was my 1,5. I used the formula C is equal to N over V, like I just showed you on the visualizer, and I got this 3 above the 1,5 here. Can you see that? So from here, I went back and I got this 3. This is the number of moles at equilibrium because that was the concentration at equilibrium. Now, from zero to three obviously means that there's been an increase in three. It's like being on the number line. You add zero and you're going to positive three. Well, you have gone three steps to the right or two, three. So this is three. Once you have this three, well, everything else falls into place. We know based on the mole ratio principle, right, that this now will result in this having 1,5 being used up. This will result in minus 4,5 based on the mole ratio principle. What is the mole ratio principle? It's the 1 is to 3 is to 2. Can you see grade 12s? If 2 mole, if 2 moles here in the balanced equation represents 3 moles from reacting, right? then one mole, according to the balanced equation, is a half of three, which is 1,5. And because it is a reactant, it gets a negative sign here. You see that? That's how this minus 1,5 comes about. I'll say that again, just so that you get it. I've got positive three here. According to the balanced equation, the mole ratio is one is to three, is to two. Two moles in the balanced equation, right, results in three moles at equilibrium, right? That's the change in number of moles. And so therefore, one mole will be half of that. If you take three, you divide it by two, you're going to get 1,5. And you must put a negative there because the nitrogen is being used up. So what about the hydrogen? Well, once again here now, one of them represents 1,5. So if you take 1,5 multiplied by 3, you're going to get 4,5. And the hydrogen is being used up as well. Same story. And so when you predicate all of this, you're going to come to your figures. The main entries that will go into our KC calculation, right, based on the formula C is equal to N over V, you're going to have this situation here, where your nitrogen will be 1,25 
mole per cubic decimeter. Your hydrogen will be one mole per cubic decimeter, and there your ammonia will be 1,5. You put that into the Kc formula. Remember, Kc is equal to the concentration of the products divided by the concentration of the reactants. Put all of that in. You still have your hydrogen, and there you use your figures, and you come to your 13 grams. Now, that's not the end of the story. Another option, you know, another two options. Here we are. You can use your concentrations as well, right? As you can see here on the left-hand side, there's your concentration. Or you can use your number of moles, right? Any one of these options can be used, and they will come to the same result. You'll notice that this number of moles here, right? The X results in 13 grams, results in 13 grams. So your main point is your concentration at equilibrium. When you have your concentration at equilibrium 1,5, to get the number of moles at equilibrium, you use the formula C is equal to N over V. All right? And then do not forget, grade 12s, that KC is equal to the concentration of the products. Remember the square brackets stands for concentration divided by the concentration of the reactants. All right, there we have it. And based on the balanced equation, those mole ratios. So in um, the formula, for example, right? When we look at the formula, the um, equation, the equation here is N2 gas plus 3H2 gas, reversible reaction. And here we have two moles of ammonia gas, right? Now, remember only gases and aqueous solutions go into the KC calculation. If we have to further populate this, our KC here, based on this formula here, the product, we're going to have the concentration of ammonia, and then we must square that, right? Because that's two moles there. So that's the square there, divided by, yeah, this is your nitrogen, N2. There's only one mole of that. And there's your hydrogen gas. And there's your cube there. So there we have an expression for our KC calculation. But they gave us the, the KC. We needed to find the hydrogen gas, and that's how we found that. All right. So a nice, easy calculation, one that certainly involves all the various elements related to chemical equilibrium. Now, let's move back to our question. Now, question 6.3, the same amounts, right? Same amount of nitrogen gas and hydrogen gas are now placed in a larger flask. And the reaction is allowed to take place and reach equilibrium at 380, 380 Kelvin. How will each of the following be affected by this change in a larger flask, right? So the emphasis is on a larger flask. All we must do is write down increase, decrease, remain the same. And we must give a reason for our answer in each case. The KC value. Well, the truth of the matter is it will remain the same. Why? Because the temperature is constant. It's still at 380 Kelvin. The temperature hasn't changed, right? And only by changing the temperature will KC be increased. You remember that fact? So the answer to 6.3.1 is the KC value will remain the same. Reason for that is the temperature remains constant and the KC value is only changed by an increase in temperature. What about 6.3.2? The equilibrium yield of the ammonia. Ooh, that's interesting. Now the ammonia, remember, is the product, right? So, how will that affect things in a larger container? There will be a decrease. That's the correct answer. 
Why? Because a larger volume, which results in a lower pressure, will favor the reaction that produces the larger number of moles. And so the reverse reaction is favored, right? There's the reverse reaction going this way here. The reverse reaction is favored, resulting in a decrease in the ammonia. All right. So there we have those two points. Now question 6.4. The temperature is now decreased to 300 Kelvin. Remember, it was at 380, but now it's 300 Kelvin. And a new equilibrium is established. How will the amount of ammonia gas formed at 300 Kelvin compared to that formed at equilibrium in question 6.3? Write down increases, decreases, remains the same? Ah, oh, this is a nice one. The answer is it will increase. Why? Because the reason is a decrease in temperature favors the exothermic reaction. Thus, the forward reaction will be favored. That's the explanation given there, based on Le Chatelier's principle. All right, so there we have it. A very, very nice question on chemical equilibrium. All right. Right, now we are going to move on to question number seven. Now grade 12, we are now in acids and bases. Okay, and as you can see, it looks like it's the ammonia day of things. So let's go through this. Okay. Okay, fine. Now, 7.1 says, ammonia, NH3 gas, ionizes in water to form a solution. Define a base according to the Arrhenius theory. Now, you may remember grade 12, there are two theories that we are concerned with in acids and bases. The older theory is the Arrhenius theory. It's from Sweden. You know, the Swedes were great and are still are very great chemists and so on. And the latter theory, or the more modern theory, is called the, the lowry bronsted or the bronsted lowry theory, whichever way you want to uh, phrase that. All right? So how do we define a base according to the Arrhenius theory? So according to the Arrhenius theory, a base is a substance which ionizes or dissociates in water and yields hydroxide. That's the OH minus ions in that solution, right? Once again, a base is a substance which ionizes or disassociates in water and yields OH minus ions. Those OH minus ions are hydroxide ions. All right, now, 7.1.2, write down the formula of the conjugate acid of ammonia, All right? Now, let me go to my visualizer. Here we are. We are told that ammonia, NH3, is in water. Now, what is the conjugate acid? So, first and foremost, right, we know that this is a base, right? Water is an ampholite, but in this case, it's serving as an acid, right? I'm just putting those little. When this ammonia accepts a hydrogen, it becomes this. This, grade 12, is the answer. This is the conjugate acid of 
ammonia. Right? Can you see that? Right? And of course, we can say plus, right? We're not concerned about that at this stage, but the question revolves around what's the conjugate acid. Can you see what's happened? The water, right? As an acid, it's a proton donor. So it donated a hydrogen to that. From H3, we get H4, and we get its iron there, NH+. That's the ammonium iron or the ammonium cation. All right. And so that's basically the story there. Right. Now, let's go across to our question here. The next one, what will the pH of the ammonia solution be? Will it be greater than 7, equal to 7, smaller than 7? It will certainly be greater than 7. Right? It will not be equal to 7 because it's not neutral. It will not be smaller than 7 because it's far from acidic. It is a strong base. And therefore, ammonia will have a pH greater than 7. 7.1.4. Use a balanced chemical equation and explain your answer to 7.1.3. Well, that's quite easy. I started you off nicely. Let me just finish off. So, we're going to start with NH3. That's the ammonia. And of course, we know that this is in its gaseous format. Okay. Then we're going to add water to that. That's going to be our acid, right? And that acid, liquid format, that's going to give rise to, as you can see there, NH4. Right? That's the ammonium ion. That's in its aqueous format. Plus OH minus. It's also in its aqueous format. Right. There's our equation. I just left that cryptically for you, not to give away the game before the time. All right. So there we have that. There we have our entire situation in connection with that reaction. Right. So that's how we basically form that. Okay. That's the balanced equation. So if we had to explain now what's happening there, well, here's the explanation. The concentration of the OH minus ion increases. Right? The concentration of this increases. Therefore, the pH increases. That's really what's happening. That's what that question was on about. Okay? So that is the answer to that. All right, very, very important. Now we come to a pH calculation. Question says, calculate the pH of a sodium hydroxide solution. Uh, we've got here 0, 0,5 mole per cubic decimeters at 25 degrees Celsius. Right. Now grade 12s, very, very interestingly, right? Almost there, quarter past, but let me just do this for you. Right, we are told that the pH, we've given um, the pH, we need to find, we're given the concentration of NaOH uh, is 0 0.5 mole per cubic decimeter. All right, and that takes place at room temperature, which is 25 degrees Celsius. So we are given these two particular important points. All right, so there we have it there. Right, now, what we need to recognize is the following. That whenever we have a base, remember when we're calculating pH, there is only one pH formula. formula. However, for the bases, we know that the ionization constant of water, right, Kw, right, is equal to the concentration of the hydronium ion multiplied by the concentration of the hydroxide ion. Right? This value, the formula sheet tells us, is 1 times 10 to the minus 14th power, right? 
And we don't know this, so I'm going to put that here in its format like that, because that's going to take us to victory just now. And the concentration of the sodium hydroxide is 0, 0,5. So I'm going to put that in brackets here, 0, 0,5. Okay, have we got that? Now, what we're going to do here now, we're going to divide both sides by 0, 0,5. In other words, what I'm saying is this, 1 times 10 to the minus 14 power divided by 0, 0,5 is equal to the concentration of the hydronium ion. Put that in on your calculator, please, grade 12s. Let's see what answer you get. Do you get 2 times 10 to the minus 14 power? Yes, you should. 2 times 10 to the minus 14 power, and that's a concentration more per cubic decimeter. Right. But that's only the first part of our calculation. The question says, find the pH. Now, the pH formula, as you know, is equal to minus log concentration of H. 3O plus. We've got the concentration of the H3O plus now. All I'm going to do is I'm going to substitute it here and use logarithmic principles to get to that. So the pH is equal to minus log 2 times 10 to the minus 14 power. When I put that in on the calculation and the calculator, calculator tells me. Therefore, the pH is equal to 13,7. There's no unit for pH. It's simply a number, right? Remember, it represents the degree of alkalinity or acidity of a compound. So there we have our full calculation. Sometimes these calculations go for five, six marks. Make sure you get that. In connection with bases, there's going to be two facets of the calculation. You're going to start with the ionization constant of water. Remember, this is a constant, so its value is given on the formula sheet. And then you read off. Take note, grade 12s. You must plan your work in order to work your plan. If you don't know what you're looking for, it's very difficult to find out what way to go. So make sure that you itemize things clearly, that you put everything down nicely. Then you come to your pH formula. Do not reason, oh, you know, I don't know what to do. Let me just write down a formula from the formula sheet. I'll get one mark. You get no marks for that. You must understand one thing, all right? Show your formula, substitute into that formula, and come to a definite conclusion, right? If the numbers are wrong, well, you'll be positively marked along the way. So you could score a few marks along the way, but don't just write down a formula thinking you're going to get a mark for that. You get nothing for that. All right, so there we have that. Okay, right. Now, grade 12s, we are close by. Mrs. Um, de Villiers, are there any questions that we have from our audience? Uh, nothing at the moment in the chat, sir. Okay. Um, and I don't see any hands raised. So okay, fine. We're good. Right, we've got about seven minutes left, okay? We've got about seven minutes left. This... Question 7.3 is a very nice question as well. What I'd like to do in the remaining seven minutes is just to go back to where we started this morning and just to highlight certain points.
we went into chemical equilibrium. We had the definition sketch for us, and then we also had our various um, you know, calculations that were involving uh, KC calculations as well, and then we rounded things off. I'd just like to go through now, in conclusion, just some of the important points that we showed you on our visualizer. All right, you remember this one? This one discussed conjugate acid base pairs. There's the base, there's the conjugate acid as well. All right, and this one showed why the pH increases because based on what's happening here in this reaction, the concentration of the hydroxide ions increases there, okay? Then I stress the importance of using this formula in chemical equilibrium. Concentration is equal to the number of moles divided by the volume, and the KC expression is predicated on the concentration of the products divided by the concentration of the reactants. Where you have a balanced equation, remember the moles become the indices or the exponents in the KC calculation as well, right? Then the collision theory. How can we explain an increase in temperature? Well, temperature increase will result in an increase in the average kinetic energy of the particles. Hence, more particles will have an EK that is greater than an activation energy. As a result, more effective collisions will occur per unit time, right? These are important points in connection with the collision theory. We then went on to look at this calculation in connection with reaction rate. Remember, we came to 97, not the 27, right? Logically, that would not be correct. And there we found out that it's 97 by virtue of the fact that when you're looking for a reactant, it must have a negative sign here in front. Then reaction conditions, organic chemistry, one of the major ones we dealt with today, right? The major sketches was this, where we have our alkanes, our alkenes, the haloalkanes, and the alcohols. Remember I said in the textbook, study and master, you'll find this schemata there. So if you want to consult that for your delectation, that'll be lovely. All right, and then you fill in all the various reactions. Then we had a look at situations like this. We came to find out what this alkane was by virtue of the fact that they gave us some very cryptic clues, but we worked to it very, very nicely. And of course, we found out the various intermolecular forces in the various homologous series. The aldehydes have London forces and dipole-dipole forces. The alcohols have London forces dipole-dipole forces, and strong hydrogen bonds. Grade 12s, if you continue revising, working through as much as possible, and as you know from the details that were given you, that there are other questions revolving around electrochemistry, electrolytic cells, galvanic cells, voltaic cells, please make sure that you accelerate your exam preparation. We have every confidence that you will succeed. And so work as much as possible through past exam papers, provincial papers, through your study guides as well, and get the help from your teachers. But don't give in and don't give up. You can do this. We know that you're going to get very, very good marks for physical sciences.